The title of our seminar today is Everyone a Singer Until They're Told They're Not. The title made me think quite deeply and it reminded me of something that happened to me when I was 10, some a long time ago. I was in my primary school and we were doing a play called Joseph and his amazing coloured coat. And I really liked the music. I practiced, I learned the words. And then when it came to the performance, I was asked to, I was asked to stand at the back and mine. I think the point I'm trying to make um, is that there are some cultures that the issue of every child being a singer would not arise. And I think there's much that we can, we can learn from these cultures. You know, Froebel saw singing with babies as a pedagogical tool, and Sasha's gonna be talking about singing with babies as a pedagogical tool, which we can use both at home and in, our, and in the kindergarten. You know, what we do with babies, what we sing with them is important. And I'm hoping that, you know, we're not only going to hear from Sasha, but we're going to hear from, from four responders today. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Sasha, uh, our reader for today. Um, those of you that know Sasha will know that she's a very modest woman. Um, up until recently, she was a professor of early childhood education and care at Canterbury Christ University. Sasha has a degree in Chinese. Her PhD looked at constructions of early childhood in Shanghai at the end of the 20th century. Her research interests have always centered on principles, policies and practices for care and education of babies and our youngest children. Her recent projects include pedagogies of care in four, in four countries, one of which I believe was Australia, the baby room and baby songs. It's important to note that Sasha, um, that all of Sasha's research looks, looks at the Afrobelian approach in policy, principles and practice. And that makes her work exemplary and it makes her work also a real valuable resource. Sasha was a chair of Tactic until quite recently, but is currently the CEO of the Froebel Trust and a visiting professor at Hong Kong Education University. And it's with great pleasure that, you know, um, I am able to welcome Sasha as our, our, our reader today. What I'd like to do now is introduce the first two responders and then after our little video, I will introduce the other two. The two responders responding to Sasha's paper, um, Singing as a Pedagogical Tool. The first one is Marjorie Ouvry. Marjorie Ouvry, Ouvry has been a Frobelian trained teacher for over 50 years. She graduated in her native Scotland in 1969, where she taught, she taught as a class teacher for nine years. Marjorie has been a head teacher for two schools, one of which was Rachel McMillan. Um, some of you may not know that Marjorie was um, a nursery nurse course tutor where she lectured on child development and education. She was later a researcher on the quality and diversity project at Goldsmiths College and University. Marjorie has been an Ofsted inspector, the moderator for the Froebel courses and an independent trainer. Marjorie has always had a passion for music and in her mid 50s, she gave up her full time job to study music full time at Trinity College. Marjorie has written articles in, in, in early education journal and a number of best selling books. Finally, what I want to say about Marjorie and she's to be congratulated is that she was awarded an honorary fellowship from her Alma Masters Goldsmiths in January 2020. So congratulations to Marjorie. Our second, our second responder is another very modest woman. This is, our, this is Jane Dyke, who is the former founder and owner of the Yellow Dot Nurseries in Hampshire. And those nurseries took part in the um, pilot course for the Froebel short courses. Jane sits on the Education and Finance Committee for the Froebel Trust and has co-authored a number of articles with Professor Tina Bruce um, for Nursery World. Jane also spoke at the Nursery World Conference a couple of years ago to launch the short courses. Um, 
Jane recently um, wrote one of the Frobel Trust pamphlets on songs, rhymes and finger play. And Jane is a, a Frobelian trained traveling tutor. Um, can I say thank you, first of all, to Sasha for doing the reading and thank you to both Jane and Marjorie, because I know it's not as easy as it looks and a huge amount of work has gone into what you are about to um, share with us now. So um, without further ado, can I go over to Sasha for the reading? Sorry, just took a moment to unmute myself there. Hello everyone, good afternoon, uh, happy Saturday to you all and thank you so much for inviting me to, to do this. I feel really honoured and um, somewhat stunned to have been asked to do this and um, thank you Stella for, for your introduction too. Um, I'm going to read a, a, a piece which is an extract from a chapter that I wrote with my colleague Cathy Gooch with whom I worked for very many years at Canterbury Christchurch University. Um, it's an extract from a chapter that was <coughs> published in the International Handbook of Frobel and Early Childhood Practice and um, uh, it's um, a reflection on a pro uh, well actually more than one project, three projects that we ran that were about singing with babies. So it starts with a section called Singing as a Pedagogical Tool. Our project sought to foreground the possibilities that singing might offer for extending the pedagogical repertoires and philosophical reservoirs from which practitioners might draw in their baby room work. We were eager to explore the synthesis of these elements in line with Froebel's view that the practice of singing is a means to externalise and share inner ideas and feelings, as well as to connect the inner and outer manifestations of the self. In our project, we aimed to help practitioners to explore their own beliefs, question practices, and consider theories about babies' care and their role in relation to this. And to consider the expression and management of emotion through these musical encounters, particularly within lullabies. Although by no means a universal activity, our focused explorations of baby room practice over the last 10 years or so suggested that singing is commonly employed in the everyday care of babies and toddlers. Friedrich Froebel's influence on practice appears to be timeless in this respect. Singing continues to be promoted as an educational activity for the nursery and songs and finger rhymes are tools to enhance children's learning experiences. Jenny Spratt has argued that singing in the nursery today rarely reflects in, uh, Froebel's intentions and it's more commonly employed to distract and keep babies happy than it is for educational purposes. The tentative findings from the initial phase of our project concurred with Jenny's view that those involved in our study reported that singing was predominantly employed as a functional tool to distract, calm, soothe, corral, or manage babies and young children. But the practitioner's views about the purposes of singing ranged over many educational intentions, including language development and social participation. However, these activities play out within a particular curricular framework that's infused with contemporary socio-political ideology. During the first phase of our project, the motives that practitioners expressed for singing with babies, which were linked to educational purposes, didn't necessarily resonate with Froebel's philosophy about babies and their learning in the company of adults. Consequently, while Froebel's legacy places singing firmly within the repertoire of early years practices, the underlying rationale may be distinctly different. The current EYFS foregrounds the educational purposes of singing as developing musical expression and creativity, but it fails to acknowledge or promote its affective potentiality. In contrast, 
Preble attributed complex meaning and purpose to singing after spending many years observing and noting children's songs and games before embarking on his own Mother Songs book. He believed that songs and the closeness of singing would help adults and babies to make intimate emotional connections. And that babies' responses within these singing encounters would convey their interests to those caring for them. Singing remains at the heart of idealised contemporary nursery practice and the value of connectedness to babies' families is upheld. But the space in between is fraught with tension and complexity as practitioners are tasked to balance babies' emotional needs and demands and their responses to these with parents' preferences and diverse views of professionalism. Our interest for this project lay in the intersection of these ideas about singing, the simultaneous unfolding of an emotionally nurturing dimension and an educational purpose, reflecting Frebel's philosophy for earliest provision to conflate acts of caring and educating within a child-centered orientation of pedagogy. At this point, I'd like to foreground our interpretation of the term pedagogy, mm. not as pertaining to the act of instruction or didactics, but as teaching and learning through cooperative endeavor and in direct relation to the multitude of environments in which this happens. Nor is pedagogy solely action, but also the attitudes, beliefs, knowledge, and understandings that inform and influence the orientation of activities. In line with an ecological perspective, we took the view that pedagogy does not evolve in isolation, but is a dynamic interaction of individuals, their contexts, and wider socio-cultural belief systems, together with the vestiges of previous iterations and experiences. This may involve ideological inscription such as that derived from policy documentation, organisational values, dominant traditions, as well as academic training, literature, peer influence or parent pressure. Singing is a universal human activity that crosses but is also shaped by cultures. The study of singing in different cultures or ethnomusicology shows that what counts as singing is not always obvious. The Muslim call to prayer may sound to the uninitiated like a form of song, but it's not classed as singing by followers of Islam. This suggests that what Mythen argued, Steve Mythen argued was singing among our Neanderthal predecessors may not necessarily have been thought of in those terms by the people making the variously intoned mmm as a means of communication. Equally, the exaggerated musicality of so-called motherese, the sing-song communication of a parent or carer to an infant, is more formally called infant-directed speech rather than song. And the distinction between speech and song has been intensified by the introduction of the specific terms infant-directed song and singies. Motherese may have melodic qualities, but it's considered a form of speech, even to the extent that researchers have argued that mothers whose language is tonal, such as Chinese or Kosa, break the rules of their language by changing the lexical tones in favor of the globally universal and emotionally evocative melody, melodies of motherese. It's been hypothesized that a mother's intuitive behavior supports the infant's innate communicative capacities, and that the two of them engage in communicative musicality. But the care of babies, of course, extends beyond mother-infant dyads, and those who nurture or parent infants include fathers, siblings, grandparents, members of extended communities, uh, families, or close-knit communities, and increasingly, those who are paid to care, such as nursery professionals. The concept of communicative musicality that Stephen Malik originated and subsequently elaborated in partnership with Colwyn Trevathan suggests that 
musical narratives allow adult and infant to share a sense of sympathy and situated meaning in a shared sense of passing time. At the heart of their conceptualization of this musical engagement between two or more humans is the sharing of an emotional connection. But their ideas aren't without criticism of the broad definition of musicality and the elitist theoretical perspective. For example, the concept's requirement that infants are viewed as socially adept and capable sits more easily within certain socio-cultural frames than others. As Deloach and Gottlieb so richly showed in their, their book, A World of Babies, what an infant is or represents varies widely and affects how cultural groups interact with their youngest children. Although the act of singing may be a universal human behavior, cultural constructs regulate beliefs about music and musical interactions with others, including babies and young children. But the challenges to Malik and Trevathan's claim that infants are innately musical and engage in communicative musicality stem from paradigmatic rather than cultural perspectives, if indeed they, these can be separated. Their concept derives from Stern's belief that babies and their intimate carers can attune to and share one another's internal emotional states, focused attention and sense of self or subjectivity, thereby becoming intersubjective. This contemporary perspective resonates with Froebel's beliefs that babies were born with innate capabilities, which nurturing relationships could help to unfold and that singing was a conduit for emotional exchange. Colin Trevathan argues that the ability to read and respond to others' emotions is intentional, whereas other psychologists have countered this view by arguing that babies' responsive behaviours, such as imitative tongue protrusion, are not intentionally intersubjective, but are perceptive. Nevertheless, Local customs permitting, there does seem to be convergence where the value of musical communication is concerned. Singing to babies not only is multicultural, although not universal, but it's also good. Our project invited practitioners to engage critically with these ideas, to explore their own beliefs about singing, and to reflect on its place, features, functions and effects in the settings where they worked with babies and toddlers. We were also inviting them to examine the ways that their roles were constructed and to make connections to the pedagogical orientations or frameworks that shaped their work. Throughout the project, we highlighted the principles and traditions of Friedrich Froebel. Our aim was to provide a pedagogical cornerstone for consideration and debate about relational issues, values, and identities. At the start of the project, nobody had heard of Froebel or was aware of his legacy. Froebel, uh, I apologize, you'll all know this bit. This, <laughs> this was written for a non frobelian audience. Um, Froebel was a great advocate of play and activities to support the nurturance of the child and to develop a bond between children and their mothers or carers. His philosophy for the care and education of children through play emphasized the importance and value of singing and its multiple beneficial effects for babies and their carers. Froebel believed that anyone who worked with young children needed to be specially trained in children's songs and to have a liking and capacity for singing. And that babies and young children needed to sing and to be sung to by their mothers and other carers. He composed numerous songs and gave instructions about their performance. The collection known as Mutter und Kosalida, or Mother Songs, includes seven of the first, the first seven of 55 songs, which pay particular attention in their composition to the feelings of a mother for her baby. Froebel intended to help and guide mothers to recognize and convey emotion expressed through singing. He believed this would cultivate babies' connectedness to their mothers and vice versa, and the world surrounding them both, 
as well as to their inner spiritual selves. In contemporary early years practice, this perspective raises a number of issues that were deliberated by the project groups. We introduced some of Frevel's ideas to the groups using his own words as prompts for discussion and always with reference to the participants' own contemporary practice. We provided each participant with a summary of Frevel's principles which were discussed during the group sessions and everyone received a copy of Early Childhood Practice Frevel today. The intention was twofold. Firstly, to raise awareness of Froebel's immense and enduring contribution to early childhood practice. And secondly, to involve the groups in a critical exploration of their own and others' philosophies and theories. We focused on singing as a pedagogical tool, making clear that the deconstruction of the practice of singing was a vehicle for investigating underlying or associated beliefs and assumptions, especially about the communication of affect and highlighting Froebel's principled approach to the promotion of singing within a pedagogy for the early years. We also shared some recent research evidence and theoretical propositions. In particular, many discussions revolved around the concept of communicative musicality, which was introduced early in the group sessions. Referring to the predisposition and intentionality of babies and their intimate care as principally mothers, to initiate and respond to one another's emotive communications following musically rhythmic patterns and extending to suggest the intrinsically musical and creative nature of parent-child interactions. We offered the participants the following statement from Colin Trevathan to consider. There's evidence that even newborn infants, with their very immature, though elaborate brains, limited cognitions and weak bodies, are specifically motivated beyond instinctive behaviours that attract parental care for immediate biological needs, to communicate intricately with the expressive forms and rhythms of interest and feeling displayed by other humans. This evidence of purposeful into subjectivity or an initial psychosocial state must be fundamental for your understanding of human mental development. Musical musicality of communications with babies and the question of predisposition, which Froebel also implied in his writing, were considered in relation to the following quotation. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is from Froebel's mottos and commentaries. You long to nourish your baby's feelings, to stir the pulses of his heart. In some way, in some slight degree, you must make him feel the love which inspires all you do. Hence, as the little play goes on, you begin to sing. And love, the melody of the heart, is revealed in the melody of the voice. And that's the end of that reading. Thank you, Sasha. Um, thank you. Um, could I could I invite our first responder, um, Marjorie Ugri, to respond to that reading, um, singing as a pedagogical tool? Could I just ask you um, about how my PowerPoint will be displayed? Yes, Marjorie, I'm going to do it. And oh, fine, can... lovely. Thank you. If you would just let me know when you want me to move on to the next slide. Then. Okay, it doesn't start at the beginning. Okay, so if you want to tell me when it starts. Yes, I'll tell you. Um, at the end. At the end. Right. At the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So was there a place you want to start? Uh, I meant it doesn't start at the beginning of my presentation. Oh, <laughs> okay, sorry. It's all okay. right. So it's if you way. let me know when you want me to share it. Then yes, lovely. Fine. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, 
speaking remotely is a new experience for me and especially trying to um, uh, squeeze it into 10 minutes. I'm not known for my ability to be brief, so um, apologies if I run over slightly. Um, now, do you want, I don't know who you're seeing. Are you seeing me? Yes. You are, right, excellent. Um, I, I wish I could see you. I like to see my audience. Right, I'll start now. Um, everyone's a singer until they're told not. It's a great title. Abba was absolutely right in Thank You for the Music when they said, my mother said I could sing before I could talk. She said I could dance long before I could walk. Our creative youngest children learn all they have to learn through music, movement and play. Frobo knew this and gave us his mother's songs, finger play and games to use as a benchmark in our own pedagogical journey. Mother tells us about being alongside parents, family and community. Songs tell us about the importance of music and culture. Finger play tells us about the importance of physicality and movement. And games tell us about the play. But I'm getting ahead of myself. More of the mother songs later. Thank you for inviting me to respond to the papers. I so enjoyed rereading the extracts from Sasha's wonderful, inspiring book, which provoked memories of my own experience of visiting local authority social services day nurseries in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Reading the, in the extracts prompted me to ask, how does one help practitioners to reflect on the way music and singing is habitually offered? Is it possible to change long standing, standing embedded perceptions, practices and cultures in relation to singing in particular? From 1798 to 1983, I was responsible each year for training of 72 nursery nurse students. I became familiar with day nursery culture as I visited my students. I therefore saw among all the activities of this most complex of jobs, how and how much music was employed. As I read the ba Baby Room Project years later and Jenny Spratt's work, I realized with not a little disappointment that some of the day nursery historical culture hadn't changed. But how could it unless proactive steps are taken as they were in the Baby Room Project? We know that very little early years music is included in teacher or early years practitioner training. With the apprenticeship model of training, the students replicate what they see and so the culture is perpetuated. This is not the case in every country. In Hungary and Poland, for example, you can't be an early years teacher if you can't sing in tune and play an instrument. Frebel would have liked that. In the meantime, with the paucity of appropriate music training, one of the strategies that can bring about change is the employment of an early years music specialist who comes and acts as a model to practitioners who can then have the confidence to weave the songs and musical activities into the children's play. What did I see and what did I do 40 years ago? I saw that the song repertoire was generally limited to a very few songs, Wheels in the Bus, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Baba Black Sheep, Bob McDonald, Wind and Bob and Up. How could this culture of low expectations of the value of music in the day nursery be changed? One strategy I used was to require my students over the two years of their training to submit a folder compiled and divided into about 20 headings with five songs, poems or games in each category such as lullabies, songs to do with farms, animals, birds, weather, transport, seasons, illness, nonsense, people who help us and so on. I had observed from my own teaching experience that when children are offered a large repertoire of songs, they combine them with their own innate musicality and discern song structures and formulate songs for themselves. For example, 
One child combined two songs we had learnt and improvised using Flies in the Buttermilk and the Big Ship Sails on the Alley Alley O, and brought to show me a junk model based on an egg box opening and shutting its fierce jaws on its hinge. I've made a crocodile EIO, I've made a crocodile EIO, I've made a crocodile EIO on the last day of September. With lots of songs at the students' fingertips, they would sing everywhere, indoors and out, and not just at together times. I also saw that the music sessions were used not so much as a conscious pedagogical tool, but more often, because the staff recognised that the children loved to sing, for the purposes of a time filler or behaviour management device to control the whole group by one member of staff while the others got on with jobs they felt the children could not be involved in, such as cleaning the bathrooms or setting the tables for lunch or clearing up toys. That culture was changed through song too. Sasha found, just as I had, that singing was merely part of the roundup of sessions and as a time filler. Singing happened with no planning, little thought of connection to the children's lived experience or philosophical underpinning. This is not a criticism on my part, so much as a note on how unreflected culture is perpetuated and is very difficult to change. Could I have slide one, please? Frugal, as you know, saw his mother songs and rhymes and games for body, limbs and senses as the culmination of all his thinking. It combined his philosophical philosophy of unity and connectedness. It was a book to be read by the whole family and community. Slide two, please. Froebel's mother songs were significant in that they emphasised features of his philosophy. Helen to Tovey's analysis of the songs is really helpful here. And I shall uh, go back to that. Slide three, please. As you can see, and as you're all familiar with, I'm, it's like teaching my grandmother to suck eggs here, because um, I know that you know, know all about the mother songs, but it's just so interesting, I think, to see the beautiful illustrations that Froebel um, had done for his book. He employed the best illustrator he could. Slide, next slide, please. Now, um, I'll just leave everybody. Um, play with limbs. Um, Froebel songs, as you know, are not easy to sing, employ a wide range in pitch and are not particularly catchy. I'll sing this one to you, uh, if I can just move the people out of the way. How the little limbs fly out, tossing, rollicking all about, thus they gain their health and strength, stamp the flaxseed out at length, to make the oil so clear and bright that feeds the pretty lamp all night, where mother's love burns still and clear while watching o'er her child so dear. His words in 19th century translation are, are archaic and quaint. Nevertheless, we're able to see his philosophy integrated into the song. Next slide, please. And the next slide, please. First of all, the close, intimate relationship between mother and other family members and child. Sitting on the mother's lap or here, lying, so that the mother could touch and caress. I hope, oh, not, not that one. The one before, sorry. And the one before. Um, thanks. You can almost see it like baby massage, can't you? The scenes in the picture illustrate the, li the child's life with which mother and baby and the whole family are familiar. Could I have the next slide and the next slide? 
Then we've got the powerful relationship between movement rhythm and learning. Finger play and movement games were very significant. Froebel introduced physical play between mother and child involving limbs and senses. Physical activity is the basis for uh, mental activity, making the outer inner. Mother singing about how the oil for the lamp is from the flax seed, which is to be produced by the strong labour. And then, the ne not next slide, but the next one down, developing awareness of symbols. The light shines bright, just like her love. This is the development of symbolic thinking and thus on the abstract, on to abstract thinking. Then, meaningful connections between the song and the child's own life. The songs are all based on the child's own experience. The fact that someone has had to produce the oil makes us, and then the last um, bullet point, it makes us respect others. Next slide, please. Um, the mother could link the eating of the cake to the farmer, to the miller, to the baker, who eventually enables the cake to be cooked for, for the child. All verbal songs have action games associated with them. Are children grateful for the work that is involved in the production of their food and clothes nowadays? It has taken the current crisis to alert people to the distribution chains serviced by people, usually low paid and low status, who actually keep this country running and be grateful to them. Froebel wove that thankfulness into his songs. Respect for others is an important criterion. Next slide. I won't sing this one because we don't have time. The powerful relationship between movement, rhythm and learning that we see in the finger games at the top of nearly all of Froebel's illustrations. Next slide, please. You see the pigeon house and the next slide, please. And the charcoal burner's hut. Um, in patty cake, for instance, um, we, I don't know if you can see me, but we would do um, pat a pat a cake, pat a cake, bake as well, bake me a cake as fast as you can, and so on. And Froebel knew about this when he wrote pat a cake. Um, and then these lovely illustrations that we can see here. Next slide, please. So. In the Baby Room project, Sasha showed that opening a door to Froebel's visionary philosophy helps practitioners to see the deep significance of well-chosen songs in the children's, adults and parents' lives. It would also make us more aware of any gaps in the repertoire. Quickly, we can look at the common songs that we sing to children. I'm a little teapot and wind the bobbin up. Do they have relevance to the children's lives? I'm not suggesting we drop them from the repertoire, but what's a bobbin can be as bewildering a question to the young practitioner as to the child, and few households now use teapots. Are the songs we teach the children based too narrowly perhaps on British history and culture? It takes a commitment to learn songs from other countries. There's Senwar de Dende Senwar Senwar de Dende Senwar Senwar de Dende Senwar de Dende Senwar de Dende Senwar An African song about a mother calling a uh, mother bird calling her baby back to the nest. No time, sadly, to teach it to you today. Last slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Marjorie. Can I ask the second responder, Joan Dyke, to, um, to put on her microphone and respond to Sasha's reading, singing as a pedagogy? 
Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Sasha. In 2014, I found myself in the back of a minibus in Scandinavia. I was in the back of a minibus with two Frobelians on a personal active research project. I was there reflecting on outdoor play in order to make a difference in my 12 nurseries in Hampshire. It was more than outdoor play that was going to be affected on this trip. Meeting these two Frobelians changed my practice and enhanced my practice going forward. Little did I know that because of this serendipitous encounter, I would soon be part of the traveling tutor pilot and reflecting deeply on my own Frobelian journey. My journey had actually started in 1990 when I read this book, Tina's book, Early Childhood Education, and decided to use it as the tool to reference the attitudes, beliefs, knowledge and understandings that inform and influence the orientation of activities, as Sasha states, my pedagogy. After eight years as a reception teacher, I was about to open my own Frobelian kindergarten. Fifteen years later, I find myself in the back of a minivan with two Frobelians who introduced me to Tina Bruce. Later that year, I find myself with 20 of my senior team thinking deeply about lullabies and finger rhymes. I'd never really thought about where children's songs had come from. Hearing that Pat Cake had come from Froebel, who had created the concept of lullabies and finger plays, seemed strangely mind-blowing. I knew that nursery rhymes were important and that action songs and movement songs were all part of good practice in the EYFS, but I hadn't really thought about the why and the philosophy behind them. Froebel emphasised the importance of interconnectivity summarised in the phrase, link, always link. And so many of his mother songs, action songs and movement games were connected to nature, occupations and everyday jobs and roles. They were part of the children's everyday lives, giving a continual link to the forms of life, knowledge and beauty. This way of thinking about the content of songs I found interesting and challenging. I had not thought about whether babies, toddlers and young children who have not experienced real life because they have only been alive for a few months might need to know about real things before they can imagine unreal things and play with ideas. Did I really know what our children were singing and listening to in our nurseries? And were we really offering an educationally worthwhile experience? Were we linking our learning as Froebel suggested we should? Were we introducing the abstract before children had established sufficient of the real? Tina introduced me to Sasha's work on the baby room and our experience mapped with hers that although singing was commonly employed in the everyday care of babies and toddlers, was it really educational? We don't know what we don't know, and nor do our children. We had our light bulb moment when outdoors with a group of two-year-olds. We were in the local woods and the children found a frog. Great excitement. Amy, our nature nursery manager, talked with the children about the frog, where they live, and asked if anybody knew what sort of sound frogs made. To her surprise and horror, the resounding reply was, tra-la-la-la-la. When she recounted this story to me, I asked, why on earth would they say tra-la-la-la-la? Amy replied, mm, because that's what we've taught them. I'm completely confused at this point. And she starts singing. Mm, went the little green frog one day. We know frogs go tra-la-la-la-la. They don't go mm, Ah, oh my goodness, we both looked at each other in complete despair, but with complete clarity. Frozen considered content to be very important. 
and that it should always be educational. Link, always link. There was a very tangible experience for us here and one which we shared with our team in our development day. The song was a popular song in the baby and toddler rooms and enjoyable to sing, but not educationally worthwhile for young children, as it misleads children about how frogs are in reality. Once children know about real frogs and the sounds they make, it might be fun to sing this sort of song because the children will know it is inaccurate and an important part of pretend plays moving from the real to the imagined in creative ways and with humour. But perhaps in order to have that kind of fun, children need to know about the, what the Frobelian Chris Athey would call the frogginess of frogs first. Returning to the Frobelian philosophy that we need to start where the learner is, we needed to find out where we were. We asked the nurseries to ensure they had a music ambassador and to find out what we were singing and why. Froebel explains how maternal instinct and love gradually introduced the child to his little outside world, proceeding from the whole to the part, from the near to the remote. So the mother songs start with the child and then go out beyond the home to the community. Froebel believed that lullabies are important to babies to nurture and build attachment. The content of songs should chime with life, knowledge and beauty. Finger plays, action songs and movement games should, as Froebel suggested, have progression. I'm just going to try and share my screen with you here. We use Tina and Jenny Spratt's stages of finger rhymes to show a physical progression to give the practitioners something to draw from. Stage one, lullabies, sung to children to nurture attachments. Stage two, rhymes and songs that use the whole hand. Stage three, rhymes and songs that use the fingers. Stage four, crossing the midline, songs that encourage hand movement extending across the body. Stage five, rhymes and songs that use the whole body. And finally, stage six, rhymes and songs using the whole body, introducing games and movement. Froebel believed that singing creates joy and a sense of community and cohesion. Within the nursery, it can be an important way of nurturing and creating attachments, calming and reassuring distressed children, strengthening bonds. Songs can create a rhythm to the day and can support flexible routines which give children a predictable environment. A singing voice is far more likely to gain attention and help get things done. By focusing more closely on what we are singing and why, definitely enhanced our practice and educational experience. Rich play develops when adults and children play together, respecting each other's ideas. When we heard Tina say this, we all agreed, but there was also a nagging doubt that this was actually happening in our nurseries. At best, we were in the parallel play zone rather than playing together. And this was also true of our singing together. On occasion, we were still using songs to distract and manage behavior rather than engaging with and developing singing in a truly Frobelian way. We were on a journey with everything provided in the indoor and outdoor environment being carefully thought through, being mapped to life, knowledge and beauty including singing and musicality. We were struggling with the freedom with guidance aspect, which is central to the Frobelian principles and the role of the adult as part of that. Lots of us still had to unlearn things we'd been doing in the past. Some of us had to engage more with careful observations, provocation-based planning, rather than outcome and activity-based planning and behavior management. 
it's interesting to reflect on our own development as practitioners and the journey we are all on as adults. Froebel says that the adult should be internally active and externally passive. As Tina emphasised during the pilot training course, this is carefully tuning into the child's interests through careful observation. But some of us were challenged and overwhelmed with finding ways of carrying out all this observation and reflection while actually playing and singing with the children. Some of us needed to hear that observation and reflection doesn't always involve standing back and recording. Taking note doesn't literally mean writing down. Knowing and understanding your key children through actively playing with them is more important and valuable than writing copious notes. Yes, there may be a minority of children who need more careful observations, but most children need an active, supportive, encouraging, enabling adult to play and sing with. I chime with Tina when she says, we need to learn that children need a rich environment to flourish, but what they really need are sensitive adults to observe, support and extend. What children can do rather than what they cannot do is the starting point in the child's education. And I believe this is true for adults too. Baby rooms are busy rooms where a lot of expertise is required to meet the needs of our under twos. Our baby team need to be given time and support to fully engage with reflecting on their practice. I agree with Sasha that the space is fraught with tension and complexity. As practitioners are asked to balance babies' emotional needs and demands and the responses to these with parents' preferences and diverse views of professionalism. The time that Sasha is referring to is a luxury in a baby room. A baby room open 10 hours a day, 51 weeks of the year, I do sometimes think that the difference between a full-time daycare setting is not fully appreciated compared to a term time nine to three maintained setting when research and training are being considered. Many practitioners, not just baby practitioners, long to, as Froebel puts it, nourish the baby's feelings. They long to stir the pulses of his heart they long to make him feel the love which inspires all they do. But often the melody of the heart and the voice are strapped for time and have competing demands. Pedagogy, as Sasha states, is a dynamic interaction of individuals and their contexts. Together with organisational values, traditions, academic training, literature, peer influence, parent pressure, as well as this ideological inscription. I believe we need to be working with the system, teacher training colleges, NVQ courses, structure, to ensure that our practitioners are, as Froebel suggests, special trained in children's songs. In 1985, when I trained as a teacher, we were made to learn the guitar. We had to have a repertoire, just as Marjorie is saying, of 50 songs documented and we had to choose 20 new songs that we did not know and have them in our folder. Oki Toki Unger was my new, one of my new songs that I remember now. And as a reception teacher and as a nursery teacher, I used for the next 30 years. Sadly, we seem to have lost this attention to detail. More emphasis needs to be given to challenge practitioners, as Marjorie suggests, to think that learning new songs is as important as topping up the sand tray. Head teachers and managers, I believe, need to better manage the resources employed to support singing and musicality. It's all very well focusing on the baby room team, but the management and system need to be involved in leading and facilitating the change. Of the 12 nurseries I was working with, the embedded change happened where the nursery manager supported, managed, measured, encouraged the change. Perhaps the missing link between research and practitioners is the need for heads and managers to engage and facilitate. We need to learn that yes, 
Children need a rich environment to flourish, but so do our practitioners. They too really need sensitive adults to observe, support and extend their pedagogy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. So much to think about the dynamic interactions of educators, the fact that educators, we, we do need to have a repertoire, repertoire of songs. And I think the mother song, as you've both alluded to, is Froebel's most important work. Um, what I would like to do now is I'd just like to share uh, uh, two little videos, two short videos with you from the from the team in Pricer. Earlier on, I alluded to the fact that there are some cultures where the idea of um, every child a singer until they're told they're not or they can't, um, that idea wouldn't arise in some cultures. And I want to share one particular culture now before I introduce our Sasha again and our final to responders. Um, can we put the video on? Thank you. Thank you for that. That was absolutely beautiful. It was just really nice watching how how they responded to each other. Um, and you know, Jane was talking about the whole hand. Again, you can see how Froebel's mother songs and finger rounds can be used in a whole variety of different contexts. Um, before Sasha's second reading, um, I want to introduce the first responder, um, Julia, I'm not Julia Manning Morton, and um, Stephanie Hardy. Steph, for those of you who don't know, was originally an archaeologist um, living in Papua New Guinea. After having her own children, she volunteered in various playgroups and primary schools. And it was a, as a result of that experience that Steph, Steph decided to train as a teacher. She has worked as a teacher, pedagogical team leader and a head teacher in the maintained nursery sector. As part of her master's degree, um, she explored how children use bikes in the outdoors. And she later, as part of her leadership team, looked at how children were developing new skills and strategies to manage their own learning in the outdoor context. Steph has always had an interest in curriculum development and has um, been involved in a number of focus studies that explores practitioners' responses to implementing centre-based curriculums. Um, Steph has contributed to a number of courses, including HND, BA, PGCE, and at master levels. Um, one of her main interests is the role of observation, um, naturalistic outdoor learning environment and the history of early years. Um, in fact, Steph and Felicity Thomas are currently co-writing a book on the history of early, early, early education, um, early years education, which I think is going to be um, published by the Froebel Trust. Steph has also written other chapters in books on outdoor learning. 
Um, for those of you that know her will know that Steph is a very modest woman and she is a fantastic um, Frobelian travelling tutor. Our fourth reader, our responder today is um, Julia Manning Morton. Julia Manning Morton is an author, trainer and lecturer in early childhood education. Her career spans some 40 years and she's had a number of diverse roles. She's worked as a practitioner, a manager, an advisor, an inspector. When she was lecturing, she lectured at London Metropolitan University for 13 years. She is currently an independent consultant and an associate trainer for early education. Julia is also a member of PICLA UK. Julia's research has, has always focused on developing practice and provision that meets the needs of children from birth to three years old and the well-being of children and their practitioners. Her current PhD study is um, researching the physical interaction between educators, infants and toddlers. Julia is also a Frobelian trained travelling tutor. Um, and Julia and Steph, I want to say a huge thank you for, for agreeing to be responders. Um, Sasha, can we go over to you for who do we think they are? Can I interrupt, Stella, before we carry on? Can we just make sure that everybody who's not speaking has got their microphones turned off so that there's not any interference? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Thank you very much. And um, just very quickly before I start reading the Who Do We Think They Are um, piece, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to um, Marjorie and Jane for those wonderful responses. Um, and, and two things that particularly struck me um, as, as you were talking. Um, in the first one, um, Marjorie, where you were talking about encouraging um, practitioners and students to create their folders with lots of different songs. I was thinking back to the project and I think part of the rationale for us talking with practitioners was about what they sang and, and, um, and um, analysing with them that uh, shared repertoire of songs was to encourage them or to encourage them to see that they had permission to sing other things. And part of the reason for that was when we said, you know, what, what do you think are good nursery songs? And are there songs that are not good? Actually, there was a very specific list of songs that were deemed to be good. And then there were other songs that were thought not to be good. And so not only um, in working with a music specialist, as you mentioned, Marjorie, who was part of the project, um, we... I suppose we're talking about permission to do something other than that um, tradition, that replication that you talked about in the tradition of a setting um, with, through the ap apprenticeship kind of learning approach to be a, a new practitioner. So um, that really struck me. The other thing that struck me too um, and I, uh, was when you showed the picture of uh, the mother's songbook with the mother who's holding the baby's legs in what could be a contemporary picture really, a, 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 perhaps apart from her dress, although I've seen photos of people in lockdown dressing up as Jane Austen characters, so maybe it could be a contemporary picture. I was thinking about that holistic experience of being sung to or sung with that um, perhaps a lot of babies had not been experiencing in settings and indeed in some homes perhaps that um, and was one of the reasons why we particularly focused on lullabies that, that um, embodied experience of being held so that you perhaps smell the smell of the person who's holding you, a familiar smell, um, or the smell of their clothes, or um, that you hear their heart beating, the tickle of the hairs on their arms touching the back of your neck, or the, the tickle of their breath as they sing, wafting on your face. And all those things uh, can't happen if you have the baby sort of lying in a circle on mats, um, not being touched uh, as, as the singer or held as that singing experience happens. Um, so I think lullabies were particularly important. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm waffling on a bit. I was just so, so touched and fascinated by what you both said in your responses. I will get on. Um, otherwise I'll hold everyone up. 
but I just want to say thank you. Um, so the second piece that I, I want to read um, is from an article that was never published because in the end Kathy and I withdrew it for various reasons. Um, it, it was called Who Do We Think They Are? Um, roles, Responsibilities and Identities of Baby Room Staff Working in Full Day Care Settings in England. And the section that um, I'm going to read is actually at the very end of the article. Um, and it begins, there are currently strong moves towards improving the knowledge of practitioners working with young children. And there appears to be a common assumption among commentators that knowledge of child development will enrich practice. In the Baby Room Project, we demonstrated that the participants had been given regulatory information disseminated by their managers, line managers and owners, some of which was accurate and some was lost in translation. They had a vast amount of experience of routine tasks and they had substantial, highly contextualized information about approaches to routines. In the professional development sessions, the participants demonstrated an immense hunger for more information, as well as wanting affirmation from one another of their practice. There may be some danger, however, in offering a delivery model or a programme of information provision to support practitioner knowledge, with research headlines being taken away by participants and represented in practice. Specifically, training in relation to child development may simply re result in another narrative layer being offered to practitioners, overlaying experiential know-how. Participants in the project were predominantly those who'd rejected the school system and who were initially rather anxious about participating in, an, in a university-led project. In relation to literacy, storytelling and talk events, how these have been received by practitioners in their own lived lives will impact on how they are then transmitted in the same way that past emotional experience impacts on new emotional interactions. In Bruner's claim, there is no innocent I. It is possible to see how an individual's own experience of family, community and culture could simply become recycled in practice. In her consideration of what constitutes an early childhood professional, a very dear colleague of ours, Mary McMullen, proposed the idea of a deliberate professional, and she offered us the following definition. A deliberate early childhood professional is one who always proceeds from a strong philosophical frame, one that's built upon her knowledge and beliefs as well as her unique capabilities and talents. The beliefs that guide professional decisions should be reasoned beliefs, ones that have come from years of deliberation on the interconnectedness of theory, research and practice, not clouded by our personal outside issues, formed out of convenient habit, or based on unexamined assumptions, but in all ways, beliefs must be defensible and stand the test of scrutiny as they are articulated to others. Such a braiding together of deliberated beliefs, knowledge of theory, research and practice, which are all regularly taken out, dusted down and re-examined, scrutinized and defended, will require a particular kind of teacher education and continuing professional development for those working with the youngest and most vulnerable children within a national system of education and care. It may be helpful to look for models from elsewhere to precipitate conversations about how this profoundly sophisticated level of professionalism can be achieved. The problems with the affordability of a qualified workforce and the legacy of a tranche of practitioners who may not fit new requirements continue to trouble both state and commercial investors. Kathy Nutt Brown called for the field to raise its aspirations in relation to early childhood education and care, while being mindful of both the financial context and the legacy of less well-trained practitioners. In support of these ideas, consideration could be given to a model developed during the Baby Room Project where progress was made in facilitating 
practitioners' professional development in two connected and significant ways. First of all, we embrace the idea of the transformative value of talk in learning. Bruner's idea of a duality of landscape, suggesting that we operate in a landscape of action and a landscape of consciousness, prompted the use of story, storytelling and stories to create a bridge between the two. Reenacting and recreating practice events, the landscape of action, offered the opportunity to develop a way of thinking through action, its influences, inspirations, cultural connections, the landscape of consciousness. In the simplest of terms, thinking together about practice, policy, events, working conditions, families, society, visions, offered participants the chance to develop their voice, which began to emerge through the project as a critically reflective voice. Secondly, the development activities supported a progression away from a simple description of events and activities, signalling practice, towards a critical response, signifying practice, as Vygotsky would say. This level of engagement grew from perceptions of practical care to a more generic response to practice and then on to incorporate a new critical response to policy consultations and directives. In a vision of children's spaces, Gunilla Dahlberg and Peter Moss promoted the notion of discursive spaces for differing perspectives and forms of expression, where there's room for dialogue, confrontation, deliberation and critical thinking, with possibilities to contest understandings, values, practices and knowledge. This kind of professional development, combined with access to information to support a developing subject knowledge base in relation to research understandings of how children develop, grow and learn has the potential to improve quality. If governments in England and in other countries are able to publicly acknowledge that early childhood care and development is a proven and powerful investment according to save the children and to seek long-term solutions then the nature and impact of daycare for babies will change and improve. <coughs> Evidence from the project, while indicating the need for rich sources of information to be channeled directly towards practitioners, also confirmed the view that knowledge itself, <coughs> as distinct from information or skills, is worthy of study. The provision of either a package or toolkit of professional information or the delivery of package training will fail to provide the knowledge required if an aspirational opportunity is to be achieved for babies and young children. The project led to conclusions indicating that careful consideration must urgently be given to three very broad but important theoretical aspects concerning those who are entrusted to care for children. First, the nature of the role needs to be understood in all its detail. Redundant debates relating to a rigid dichotomy between education and care need to be discarded particularly as they seem to have been employed to create categories of professionals, education and training, paying conditions of work that are unhelpful. These kinds of functional activities with which those employed to care for the youngest infants seem to spend the majority of their time must be reconsidered to encompass opportunities for talk, interaction and development as well as serving a functional need. Additionally, an expectation of inquiry and critical engagement can be built into the requirements for work with babies who are vulnerable and sensitive to levels of intimacy and commitment to their care. These enhanced expectations will also require reconsideration of pay, progression and conditions of service. Secondly, the nature of the knowledge required of those to employ with uh, employed to work with babies and very young children needs to be carefully considered. Common assumptions being made that simply supplying information about child development will enrich the experience and outcomes for babies needs to be challenged. Information from the project suggests that while this would be welcome, it will not be sufficient. Enabling new and existing members of the workforce to become knowledgeable requires more than a narrow emphasis on child development to be provided. 
professional education, training and development that include knowledge of national and international policies and practices, knowledge of others' theories of practice, and the development to opportunity, uh, the opportunity to develop and articulate one's own will help prevent a narrow emphasis on a simply measurable set of skills and information. Instead, practitioners can be urged towards the development of critical theories, knowledge and understanding of their own and others' ways of caring for babies, as well as new critical knowledge of the importance of the diverse nature and cultures of families and communities amongst whom they work. And thirdly, the nature of those employed to care really matters. And new ways of considering who cares for babies in out of home settings is essential. The development of high quality practice is a frequently heard intention and some nations can be seen to be working toward or apparently achieving this aim with often cited examples of Finland and Sweden and more recently Denmark. Who governments think should look after babies and how they are uh, educated and intellectually nourished may reflect contemporary values in relation to babyhood and baby caregivers childcare in general, and from then on, the impact of those decisions will affect all our futures. I think I'll stop there, actually, because I've been talking for quite a long time. Uh, I'm going to miss out the very last bit, Stella, and stop there. Okay, Sasha, thank you. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, can I ask our first responder, Steph Hardin, our third responder, sorry, Steph Hardin, to um, respond? Do you want to put on your mic, Steph? Yeah, it is on, isn't it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just before I start, just to say that Felicity and I are writing a book about the our, a case study of the nursery that we worked in, situated within the history of the nursery school, not the history of the nursery school. That would be too hard, I think. Um, so my response to Sasha's paper is a, a personal response and it resonated with me in two ways, in two experiences that I've had. The first was the work that I've been doing with DST on documenting the history of our maintained nursery school, the one that we worked on for over 20 years together. And the second was some research I've done a few years ago for an institution focus study which looked at educators responses to creating developing and reviewing a center-based curriculum i was drawn first to the quote from mcmullen and particularly the idea of a deliberate professional who is enabled to weave together understandings of philosophical theoretical and research evidence with their own individual strengths and interests most importantly, this professional is empowered to articulate, discuss and critique their own beliefs and practice. The paper described how the Baby Room Project offered participants the space to develop a critical and reflective voice by talking together about practice events and being offered information to develop subject knowledge in relation to research understandings on how children develop, grow and learn. For me, the key part of this enabling process is creating a space or forum where educators can share, discuss and critique practice. The space needs to have an agreed focus to contain the discussion. Basing the talk around observations of and questions about practice roots deliberations in reality with real children and known contexts while offering a space to make links with philosophies, theories and research evidence. This process values the experience of educators, but presupposes a felicita felicitator or a mechanism that is able to introduce these links. So I was thinking about these matters while documenting the history of the nursery school and a key event in helping the nursery school develop a positive approach to researching practice was using Pascal and Bertram's Effective Early Learning Self-Evaluation Programme. It acted as a, a process and mechanism for 
opening discussions about practice and provision and introduced the nursery to the action research process. It gave it tools for evaluating the teaching and learning and gave permission to observe children and most importantly each other. It also prompted us to analyse and debate these observations collectively to develop quality in our setting. Taking part in this process gave us confidence as individuals and as an organisation in the longer term to engage in and critique theories, philosophies and our own practice. This programme initiated discussion and debate as a nursery school community around what we consider as good practice. As time went on, we felt we could benefit from an external facilitator and developed a close relationship with an independent early years expert, our critical friend, who supported us to make links with research and theory through our collective annual review of the curriculum. The critical friend also made visits to observe the environment and interactions in the nursery and was able to give general and individual feedback on what was observed so that we could support development of the practice. Further study was encouraged and the conclusions of any projects or dissertations were implemented and evaluated in order to improve practice across the nursery. We also engaged in research funded by other bodies when it complemented our priorities. This support for study and reflection was often hard work as educators had not always had positive experiences of learning institutions and methods. In addition, for those who had been in the profession a long time, it was a different way of working and demanded a shift in emphasis in the roles and routines they were used to away from the functional activities and routines and towards the focus on children's growth and development. There were three things that were key in building educators' confidence and therefore critical engagement with practice and theory at the nursery. The first was an annual review of the curriculum rooted in observations of individual children made by educators, usually key persons and discussing these with reference to research and theory to develop an agreed and shared language around practice at the centre. The fact that it was based on educators' own observations of known children gave it validity, valued the role of the educator and encouraged a professional culture of reflection Steph, your mic's gone on by mistake, so you need off. You need to put it back on. Yeah. Do I need to go back? Please, yeah. Where to? The three things that were key in building educators' confidence? Yeah? Yes, please. And therefore, critical engagement with practice and theory at the nursery. The first was an annual review of the curriculum rooted in observations of individual children made by educators, usually key persons, and discussing these with reference to research and theory to develop an agreed and shared language around practice at the centre. The fact that it was based on educators' own observations of known children gave it validity, valued the role of the educator and encouraged a professional culture of reflection to develop. The second was regular peer observations of educators engaging with children using a format that looked at what you could learn from your colleague. These observations involved everyone, including the head teacher. Everything, time was given for reflection and feedback between the observee and the observer. With careful organisation, this enabled the sharing of good practice across the centre and recognise and acknowledge the particular skills and interests of individuals. The third was to encourage educators to further explore their own professional interests, either through study or through exploring practice. The results of these investigations were then shared with colleagues in team or training meetings. 
One of our reflections on finishing the history of the nursery document was that encouraging educators to research their own practice in informal and formal ways was a useful tool to deepen individual knowledge and understanding. It promoted a commitment to the development of education and of the nursery in the long term. Creating the conditions for this to happen was a challenge, but the benefits were strong and it created a strong motivated team with a dynamic and forward thinking culture within the setting. setting. The second experience that resonated with Sasha's paper was a piece of research I'd undertook looking at educators' responses to the process of developing a centre-based curriculum. I had presumed that an understanding of how theory and relevant research evidence supported practice would be a factor that helped educators gain confidence. In fact, the role of theory in the development of pedagogy was viewed by educators as of secondary significance to engaging with the process of shared dialogue. Educators viewed this dialogue as providing important opportunities to learn from each other around daily practice and their own observations of children. They saw the benefit of developing a common language around working with young children which supported a sense of professional community. Interviews and questionnaires revealed that educators felt that the process of evolving a centre-based curriculum based on real experience contributed to the growth of a professional identity and was a vehicle for professional development. It offered an opportunity to codify agreed good practice through documenting the adult's role in supporting the curriculum. It also positioned the educator in the role of an active and reflective learner. The process of review of the curriculum and the pedagogy that supported it also contributed to a developing sense of what it was to be an educator of young children. The documenting of skills required for supporting children's learning is a starting point for defining a professional identity. It provides an opportunity opportunity to acknowledge aspects of the work as professional skills rather than tacit knowledge, that is, describing practice as spontaneous or something I just do naturally. By being explicit about the skills used and by sharing and agreeing the nature of these skills, a professional identity is constructed and this in turn supports a positive self-image and increases confidence in practice. Interviews and questionnaires showed that particular theories and research were quoted, quoted and had informed and influenced the process of curriculum development, but these were understood as secondary to the opportunities for having dialogue around practice, developing shared approaches to learning and development and articulating the adult's role. The view of the educator as a person that has particular professional skills that can be discussed, explored and evaluated is a prerequisite for being a deliberate professional. To enable this, it is very important to provide spaces for articulating, sharing and debating practice. This contributes to creating a learning community and a shared language around professional skills and knowledge which can be linked to philosophies, theories and research evidence. To create the conditions where reflective educators can thrive, the following should be considered. Providing an environment where professional skills and understandings are acknowledged, documented and defined. Using an external expert to facilitate discussion and make links to theory and research. Creating a space for regular and shared dialogue around practice and observations of children providing opportunities to observe and learn from others, creating a space to reflect on and evaluate one's own professional practice, and last of all, giving opportunities to share the results of individual research work with the YT community and or have it implemented and evaluate, evaluated to benefit the setting. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um... We're going to go straight over to Julia Manning Morton. Okay. Uh, thank you first um, to Sasha uh, for your wonderful readings, obviously on issues that are very closely related to my heart and to the previous 
responders. And of course, thank you to you, Stella, for inviting me to uh, contribute. Although I have to say my thanks are slightly qualified um, by the strong feelings of anxiety that have accompanied me doing this. Um, feelings, you might assume, uh, that are quite usual in response to such a situation. We all get nervous at doing these things. Yet, for someone like me who is used to presenting in groups, such a strong response warranted some reflection. And this reflection made me realise that it was because today I'm not just responding as the academic me, but the professional and the me, me. In the title of Sasha's paper, although the academic me is part of the we, um, <laughs> part of the we, the professional and the me, me is the they. I am that nursery nurse who dropped out of school early and went to work in a baby room. I'm not telling you this to be self-indulgent, but very importantly to position myself, my experience and values, which inform both my professional identity, my teaching and research practice, and therefore how I read and respond to ideas. As Sasha's paper so um, adequate, you know, says, there is no innocent eye. We all bring that to what we do. I believe, though, that my position makes me very aware of the discourses around early years practitioners, particularly those working with infants and toddlers, and also of the power dynamics inherent to our professional structures and the covert issues of class and ethnicity and processes of othering that permeate those structures. So, uh, I re relate very closely and agree so much with a lot of what has been said already today. Um, but my response here is, is personal, um, which is quite handy really, because uh, 14 years ago, I wrote a paper <laughs> called The Personal is Professional, which very much concurs with many of the issues Sasha's paper discusses. In that paper, I proposed that professionalism in the early years field is not just about something that is externally identified in terms of qualification or areas of knowledge. It is essentially personal as it is necessarily about the day to day detail of relationships between educators, children, parents and colleagues, all of which demand high levels of physical, emotional and personal skill, as well as knowledge. So in this view, being a truly effective early years professional requires a reflexive interpretation of those relationships, not only through the lens of our theoretical knowledge, but also through the mirror of our subjective personal histories and our present feeling embodied selves. Therefore, on reading McMullen's statement, that professional decisions should be reasoned beliefs, not clouded by, by our personal outside issues. Um, I detected a Western European Cartesian mind-body dualist philosophy that prioritizes rationality over emotion, invokes a traditional concept of professionalism, which values knowledge over skills, and thereby also feeds into that false differentiation between education and care in our field that Sasha mentioned earlier. This split, I'm afraid, remains endemic in our structures and becomes explicit in our struggle to find the language to describe ourselves. Who are we? Practitioners, teachers, educators, educarers, caregivers, Cathy Nutbrown suggested that the solution was for us all to be teachers. But what kind of teacher would that be? What areas of knowledge and skill would be valued in that role? And for me, for this concept of teacher to be acceptable, I would suggest that we would need to 
um, not only broaden the range of knowledge served up to practitioners and to foster critical thinking, but also to challenge what we consider to knowledge to be in the first place. And to make sure that it includes what Lally calls the art of caregiving, giving, that pedagogy of care. And in the work I'm doing currently, this means foregrounding embodiment and the physicality of practice. Working with young children is often literally manual work, which is another reason why it's not seen as professional, of course. But actually, those everyday functions of physical care and embodied emotional interactions are fundamental to supporting and promoting children's well-being, their sense of self, and their, of course, their ability to relate to other people. Emmy Pickler said that to the child, our hands are who we are. And therefore, as they internalize the messages that our hands transmit, who they come to think they are. And Uta Strube, who is a Picklerian in Germany, even suggests that world peace starts on the nappy changing table. Um, I'm going to issue a trigger warning for what I'm going to say now, particularly for our um, any black or minority ethnic members of our audience. Because although this might seem an overstatement on Uta's part, I would suggest that a child who has been nurtured with respect for consistent physical and emotional care would be less likely to grow up to be a police officer who has scant regard for his fellow human. So the knowledge and skill of caregiving is fundamental to effective practice and developing such depends on the ability of practitioners to balance self-awareness and emotional responsiveness with a professional perspective, combining reasoned belief and personal awareness. I've called this developing a cycle of emotionally intelligent practice. In this cycle, you cannot address the needs of the children without addressing the physical, emotional and learning needs of the adults in, who care for them in similarly emotionally intelligent ways. For me, this means valuing personal experience as a source of knowledge, because although knowledge is power, self-knowledge is empowering and early years practitioners need both. And as Sasha and Cathy suggest in their paper, discursive spaces where there is room for dialogue and critical thinking are key to this. And it has certainly been my experience in uh, research projects um, that I have led um, uh, and professional development um, situations that such discursive spaces do create opportunities for practitioners to build on their professional understanding, particularly where subject knowledge is combined with reflection in a process based on observation um, that includes feeling as well as thinking and doing, and where the emphasis is as much on the process of the group dynamic as on the content. And this, of course, requires group conveners to extend their knowledge and skills across disciplines to incorporate understandings of group dynamics and process. And of course, developing such self-knowledge as well as knowledge about children has to take place in an atmosphere of trust and mutual respect. So for such spaces to be safe enough to also explore the difficulties challenge practices and contest understandings, personal and professional contexts need to be explicitly acknowledged and issues of difference and power, particularly between the researcher or group leader and participants must be actively addressed. We need to own our privilege and watch our language. In contexts of collaborative inquiry and mutual learning, where practitioners can develop living theory, an enhanced sense of professional worth and voice can flourish. And the question has been raised as to whether such collaboration and the development of practitioners as researchers might be key to raising the status of the profession. 
This, however, I think would depend on what and who is heard and valued in that research process. And must also entail not only a recognition and understanding of practice on the micro level, but also of the wider social and organisational structures that impact on our individual power to transform practice. It's necessary to see this not as an individualised issue, but an issue that reflects the wider unequal and discriminatory structures of our society and the neoliberal politics that have shaped it over the past 40 years. The pandemic has highlighted starkly how government views childcare and education solely as a prop of the economy. But it has also engendered a new respect generally for carers. The question is whether this will generate pressure to address the chronic underfunding of early years provision and the poor pay and conditions of practitioners, particularly those working with the youngest children. Um, and for me, um, as long as policy see, still sees childcare as the private business of the family, rather than the public concern of society, um, not a lot is going to change. So to finish, last time we were all together, um, Stella um, suggested that play is political. So today uh, we're suggesting that as well as the personal being professional, the personal and the professional are also political. Thank you. Yeah, that was you. That was powerful. Um, thank you. Can I ask um, Sasha to um, turn on her mic and respond? Thanks, Sasha. Yes, thank you so much. Um, thank you, first of all, Steph, um, for the very personal um, story about your experience of um, finding ways to include the kind of um, spaces for um, reflection that uh, we were talking about in the paper and um, so much of what you said um, was familiar um, and exciting um, but it's hard isn't it um, to, 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 to find that space as Jade Dyke mentioned in her, her previous response. Um, and Julia uh, you are so right uh, to have pointed out that, well, all the things that you said um, about the Cartesian rationality, of course it's in there. And um, it's funny, isn't it, when you read back on things that you've written previously, I, I'm, I'm infused by Bell Hook's work. And of course, Bell Hooks talks about the importance of it, exactly what you've described, the, the, the personal and the professional. And um, I've tried to live by her uh, standards, although not live up to them I clearly haven't lived up to them um, so thank you for pointing out that very very important point um, because I think it's easy to hold on a pedestal words that sound good I love the idea of deliberating the play on words with deliberating and I do think what that what Mary has said about um, using the word deliberation is an important part of um, all our lives as professionals um, holds true but you're quite right to say that um, we should be promoting the personal and for that to include the embodied, the, the, uh, the emotional. Otherwise, we're buying into a very masculine form of professionality and professionalism. So thank you for saying that um, and reminding us of that. Of course, you're also right to talk about privilege, discrimination and voice. And one of the things that really struck me when you were speaking and talking about who's heard is that paper. Um, Kathy and I talked for a long time about, we were going to call it, who do we think we are? And we said, we don't have a right to write that. Um, because we're not the practitioners. So we have to say, who do we think they are? But in so doing, of course, there is that othering that happens. So I'm really glad you pointed that out too. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's, it's a difficult one because it, it does um, accentuate that position of um, having a voice uh, that we were able to convey through that article about our view of the project, rather than it being um, a voice of those who 
were within the project um, as our partners. So um, I think I'd better stop because I know we've been going on for perhaps a little bit longer than we were meant to, but I, um, um, I found it so uh, inspiring listening to all the responses. Um, you've all got so many wonderful, much more wonderful things to say than I've ever said. So I really appreciate having the opportunity to listen to you all today. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, I think before, I think one of the things I want to say is the idea of um, us as a community of learners is really important. And I think we mustn't forget how Froebel first started. He had lots of local talks. They had no college. People just came together to listen to each other. And I almost, and, 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 and I think, you know, we're getting, we're getting used to this. I'm now able to set up my own Zoom meetings. This is not something I thought I was able to do. I think we need to find new ways to kind of engage in very new ways of working and, you know, continue to see ourselves as um, a community of learners. I want, to, I want to close the session with a Frobelian quote. <clears throat> the purpose of education is to encourage and guide man as a conscious thinking and perceiving being in such a way that he becomes a pure and perfect representation of that divine inner law through his own personal choice. Education must show him the ways and meanings of attaining that goal. And as a community of learner, that, learners, that's, that's what we have to go out there to do. Um, you know, I really want to say thank you, Sasha. A huge thank you to you. A huge thank you to Marjorie Ouvry, Jane Dyke, Stephanie Harding, and Julia Manning-Morton. I feel absolutely nourished and I, I hope the rest of you do too. <laughs>